Therefore, it's time for members' statements. The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Well, thank you, Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. As the final weekend of the 2016 Canadian Auto Show revs up with a tribute to the 100th running of the Indy 500, a celebration of this great race and the Canadians who have fought for victory there. A collection of nine cars from the Indi Indianapolis Motor Speedway Museum will be on hand, including Jacques Villeneuve's 1995 Indy winner, the Renault 95i, and the Lola McKenzie financial number 15 car that Scott Goodyear rode to his second place Indy finish in 1992. Of course, while the century-old race provides the backdrop, this year's show features many of the favourites that auto show fans look forward to each and every year. More than 1,000 cars, trucks, SUVs, concept cars, and motorcycles are featured among the 650,000 square feet of exhibits, displays, and attractions at the Metro Toronto Convention Centre. Visitors with a taste for the exotic uh, car can check out the Auto Exotica display featuring $25 million worth of cars, including Rolls Royce, McLaren, Ferrari, Maserati, Bentley, and the Austin Martin. To top it all off, Speaker, a very special guest appearance will be, made, will be made tomorrow as the Batmobile escapes Gotham and touches down in Toronto for a star-studded day and dark night. So I encourage auto and superhero fans alike to fire up those engines, bundle up the family, and head down to the Metro Toronto Convention Centre for the centuries, or the, our country's largest consumer show, the 2016 Canadian International Auto Show. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. <clears throat> Further member statements, member from Kitchener and Waterloo. To rise today to talk about a recent visit I made to an innovative company in Waterloo Region Class 1. Barry Hunt, President and CEO of Class 1, is with us today in the Members Gallery. Class 1 makes equipment to recapture anesthetic gases vented by hospitals, help, helping them to reduce the carbon emissions. It started off as a small business in Barry's basement in 1995 and hasn't stopped growing since then. They have taken on a new challenge, fighting hospital-acquired infections. 80,000 Ontarians are infected every year in hospital. 4,000 of them die. Every 42 seconds, another Ontarian is infected. Every two hours, another patient dies. Hospital-acquired infections, or HII, HAIs, are the third leading cause of death in Canada, responsible for more deaths every year than car accidents, breast cancer, and HIV combined. These deaths are preventable. Class 1 is working to reduce hospital infections by 80% by 2024. They have developed technology that will break the chain of infection by scouring the surfaces of hospital rooms with ultraviolet light to kill hidden bacteria. The estimated direct cost of these preventable infections is $20,000 per case, or $1.5 billion in Ontario every year. The cost of prevention is far lower than the cost of treating patients who are unnecessarily infected. I'm hopeful that the upcoming 2016 budget will reflect this much needed and important investment in our health care sector. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the member statements, the member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recently, in my riding of Kitchener Centre, we had a visit by the Honourable David Colonnette, Ontario's recently appointed Special Advisor on High Speed Rail, and he came with a team of policy experts from the Ministry of Transportation on a fact-finding mission to hear local voices offer their input, their ideas and their expectations on advancing the province's visionary plan to build a high-speed rail network in the Windsor to Toronto corridor. So we had municipal leaders there, representatives from the tech sector, manufacturing, academia, financial services and environmental groups. And uh, we heard outstanding feedback from these people. The roundtable sessions ran about two hours. Let me offer you some of the highlights. As we brand ourselves in Waterloo Region as the Silicon Valley North, we need faster and more frequent rail service tied to our economic development. Those trains need to flow in all directions. This is going to help us to attract the talent that we need to keep innovating and creating jobs. And it needs to connect with our LRT system, our light rail transit system, which is now under construction. Mr. Speaker, all around the globe, you will find high-speed trains servicing the public. In Spain, China, Austria, the UK, Italy, South Korea, and even Uzbekistan. We know that we have the know-how here in Ontario, and now with a willing federal partner, we have the political will to stay on track with this ambitious plan to bring high-speed rail to the people of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you for the member statements. The member from Sarnia, Lambton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> I rise today to recognize the passing of Mr. Ivan Mader, 
on February 16, 2016, just 10 days after celebrating his 96th birthday. The beloved husband of the late Bell Mater, Ivan, was a loving father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. After working on the family farm and across the prairies during the Deep Depression, Ivan joined the Royal Canadian Navy in 1941 and served until 1945, crossing the Atlantic a number 30 times, which was quite uh, extraordinary in those days. He met Bell in El Belfast, Ireland during the war, and they were married in Inwood in 1946. Following the war, Ivan embarked on a career in construction in Sarnia. Over a four-decade period, he built homes and apartment buildings, the Sarnia General Hospital, commercial buildings, and industrial parks. Ivan was a longtime member of the Progressive Conservative Party locally, the Golden K. Kiwanis Central Baptist Church, the Committee of Adjustments for the City of Sarnia, the Sarnia Legion, the Sarnia Lakeview Cemetery Board, and many others. He was also active with the Shriners of Mocha Temple, recently receiving his 70-year membership pin uh, for the Masonic Order and was a recipient of the John Ross Matheson Award from the Scottish Rite of Canada for service in 2012 and the 2012 Queen's Jubilee Medal. Always active, Ivan enjoyed dancing and garden, gardening. He once led a project to plant over 100 American sweet chestnut trees throughout southwestern Ontario. I am th thankful that I had the privilege to call Ivan Mater a good friend for so many years. My deepest condolences to his loved ones. Ivan will be dearly missed by his family and the broader community of Sarnia Lamp. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Welland. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to remind members of the House of the plight of hundreds of hardworking families affected by Goodwill Industries' decision to close their stores earlier this year. On January 18th, without warning, Goodwill Industries closed all of its 16 stores in Toronto, Mississauga, Brampton, Newmarket, Barrie, Aurelia, and Brockville, putting hundreds of people out of work. As the Labour critic, it's both alarming and disheartening to know that our government has done nothing to get to the bottom of what led to hundreds of Goodwill employees in these communities being out on the street without warning. Goodwill received millions in revenue in 2014 and at least $4 million a year from the province. The CEO, whose decision it was to shut down operations, citing fiscal crisis, makes well over $230,000 a year. Meanwhile, the almost 500 affected employees, the lowest paid workers probably in this province, and those who need our help most, and their livelihood relies on these Goodwill stores staying open. They depend on their government, and all they've gotten so far is silence and inaction. These workers are dedicated, they've worked hard for Goodwill, and the stores were pillars of their communities, and they're being thrown out of work without notice, and that's devastating to them. The government's silence and inaction is unacceptable, in my opinion, on this issue. So I stand here today with New Democrats, and I urge all members of this House to do the same thing and get some action to get these people back to work. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Merci, Mr. President. As we approach the end of Kindness Week, I'd like to encourage all Ontarians to think about how we can be generous to the people around us. One of the kindest acts a person can do is consent to the Trium Gift of Life Network. With respect to the Trium Gift of Life Foundation, this is an extremely generous, it is the most generous act that a person can make. Carefully considered. There are currently 1,620 Ontarians waiting for a transplant. Every organ donation can save up to eight lives. By making the decision to donate, a person gives hope to patients waiting for life-saving or life-enhancing uh, life transplant. In my riding of Ottawa South, over 36,000 residents have consented to donate their organs. I am proud to represent such a generous community. There's still room for improvement. I'd like to encourage my colleagues to remind their community about the importance of organ donation through their householders and other correspondents. Encouraging this meaningful act of kindness could make the world of difference to someone in their lives and someone in our communities. To promote, promoting this act can make all the difference for someone in our community and for their family. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from York Simcoe. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to uh, take this opportunity to express some concerns about the uh, Ontario Pension Plan. Of course, we all want Ontarians to have a secure and stable retirement. However, I feel it's important to bring up uh, some of the, or consideration, some of the following situations. What if you are an 18-year-old student 
working part-time at a store to help pay for university. You pay into the ORPP once fully implemented. You attend Teachers College and become a teacher at 25. What happens to the eight years of previous contributions? Or what if you work part-time at a local college, a coffee shop to help pay for college? At 30, you move to Vancouver for a new job opportunity. You stay in Vancouver and retire there. What happens to the 13 years you contributed? Or what if you pay into the Ontario pension for a few years and then land a job with a great pension? How does that impact your contributions? There are many questions that are yet to be answered about the Ontario Pension Plan or questions where the answers seem to change. If the, is the ORPP portable? If yes, how will that work? If your spouse outlives you, will they get a benefit? But perhaps most concerning, what if your employer can't afford the ORPP and the, you lose your job? At the end of the day, if you don't have a job, you don't have a pension. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to speak today on the recent trade mission to India. I was fortunate to be among the delegates that joined Premier Kathleen Wynne on this successful and important trip. Mr. Speaker, it was an incredible experience, one that has not only strengthened Ontario's ties with a valuable trade partner, but also strengthened vital cultural ties. Over the course of 10 days, 65 agreements were signed with a value of more than $240 million, including the creation of more than 150 jobs in our province. And as our business ties continue to grow, so will those job numbers. As the Premier puts it, Mr. Speaker, we're building a brain chain between India and Ontario. India is an emerging market, and trips like these create valuable opportunities for Ontario businesses. But it was also an incredible cultural experience. India is a beautiful country, and we were welcomed with open arms. I was lucky enough to be invited to lay a wreath at the grave of the great Mahatma Gandhi, a moment that was both humbling and unforgettable for me. In addition, I was also fortunate to visit the Golden Temple and see important projects on the ground for women's issues. It was truly a humbling experience. I am so thankful to have had the opportunity to join the trade mission to India. Thank you so much for letting me speak, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And further member statements. The member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. On a cold winter's night on January 4th, a neighbour of the Classy Lane Stables Training Centre in the township of Puzlinch spotted flames in one of the five barns. After calling 911, he stood helplessly with others, unable to rescue the 43 racehorses inside because of thick black smoke and flames. Firefighters from five departments, including my neighbouring community of Cambridge, were called to the blaze. The fire marshal is still investigating the cause. The loss has devastated the horse racing community. Don Legace from Cambridge was working with seven horses that were housed at the Classy Lane stables. He rushed to the scene but said he was helpless as the building that contained his livelihood and beloved horses was engulfed in flames. The deaths of the 43 racehorses are more than just a professional catastrophe. It's like losing family members, many said. About 20 people lost their jobs, and a GoFundMe site was set up. It has raised over $500,000 to assist them. I phoned owner Barb Millier, who is very grateful from the call from Premier Wynne and many others for their tributes and donations to those who lost jobs. Agriculture and Rural Affairs Minister Leal visited the farm, and his staff worked with the owners after the fire. I, at an evening vigil, I joined horse lovers employees and firefighters to remember the horses that perished and the human lives that were impacted. Thank you to all of those who have reached out to those affected by this terrible loss. Thank you. Thank all members for their statements. It's now time.